Brilliant, super, well, wow. Um, good afternoon and thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to see all of you here in the room together. Uh, welcome on behalf of myself and Susanna um, and Mazen, who are co-directors of the Center for Law and Social Change, uh, which is a center we have here at the Law School at City University, um, which aims to be an actively feminist, anti-racist and decolonial center for discussion, uh, for thought and for research um, between all of us in, in praxis as well as in uh, research and studies. Um, so I, I, it falls to me to give you the official uh, notice about fire exits and toilets. So the fire exit is behind you or in front of you. In fact, you can go in both directions depending on where fire is coming from. Uh, the, uh, there is no fire alarm scheduled this evening, so you, um, if you do hear something, please make your way either up or down uh, to the fire exits. Um, also, we have uh, toilets which are gender neutral for uh, the occasion, uh, behind, uh, through the corridor, uh, along the corridor, very close by on your right, or by the stairs where you probably came on uh, if you turn, uh, uh, where you came up if you turn left. Uh, there's toilets there as well. So uh, that's that. Um, thank you very much for joining this evening. In uh, these dark times, I think it's important to be in community. And we've, um, I, it was uh, for me important to organize this event. Um, I know we all feel like, what can we do? What are we going to do? Is incredibly. Um, it's an incredibly difficult uh, sort of uh, uh, a time and space to, to feel like we can do anything meaningful, but I think that being in community and as queers, I don't want to speak for everybody, but as queers, that is kind of what we do, isn't it? So um, also uh, from, uh, from November, I've really been impressed by uh, going to the first uh, banner making uh, session in Bethnal Green, that it was the queers who immediately uh, stood up and immediately without question and without hesitation uh, came and uh, resisted uh, the violence that was uh, started and is ongoing uh, today. Uh, I remember being there in that room and seeing all the signs, the traditional ones like silence is, is death and the others including uh, many, especially from the uh, double minority queers, the Tamil queers for Palestine, the Azadi gays for Gaza, I've, um, we've, we've been there and we've stood up um, and mobilized. So of course this queer, um, uh, the history of queer solidarity with Palestine predates um, October when we, uh, for example, when, when we back in the day uh, founded uh, the group Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrants um, several years ago, we didn't only do that to support uh, queer migrants specifically, although we also did do that, we did it in order to fight the ways that LGBT identities are being wielded by those in power to stoke um, hatred, to stoke anti-Muslim and anti-migrant uh, narratives. Queers know something about oppression and we are willing to stand up to fight it. And here, of course, I use queer in a political sense, not just meaning LGBT, etc but in the sense of resistance against the heteronorm, resistance against patriarchy, resistance against the structures of ableist, white supremacist, imperialist, cis heteropatriarchal capitalism, of which this current Israeli war against Gaza is just one manifestation. And I want to say something about hope, because as well as being in community, both here in the room uh, today on the many actions, dark actions we've seen over the last uh, few months and the huge demonstrations that we've seen here in London and elsewhere around the world. Um, at the same time that Palestine's liberation looks more distant than, than ever, I feel in fact it is closer than ever. And why do I say that? In the, it might sound flippant, but actually um, I feel hope from the fact that more and more of us each day realize that our, all our liberations are tied up together. No one is free until Palestine is free. And to get free, we have to build a wholly different kind of world from the ground up. 
and it is up to us to do so. As our fav my favorite uh, queer hero, Angela Davis, said, Palestine is the litmus test for the moral conscience of the world, and that world is massively shifting to liberation and to a free Palestine. So moving on now to the practical, <laughs> the practical part, um, how this is going to work. So first I'm going to hand to uh, Faria Awan, who's uh, going to introduce the Accept Palestine event series, which we're proud to be one iteration in, and that started at the LSE. Uh, then I'll hand you over to Karis, um, who will kick off my colleague Karis uh, Campion from Sociology here at City, who will kick off the conversation. And then around uh, 7 to 7.15, we'll have a short uh, comfort break. And then we'll have uh, our Q&A, our audience participation uh, element, where Reid, um, who you've met at the uh, intro um, desk, uh, will do the, the mic for the Q&A. So we expect to finish at around 8.30. I hope that's okay with you. Of course, if you do need to leave earlier, please do so. You can also leave through the back and come around and get down the, um, the same stairs that you probably came up on. All right, over to you, Freya. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I just wanted to introduce the Except Palestine series and invite you to take it to your universities across the UK. Um, to begin with that, I wanted to just, get, if you can hear me, I just wanted to read a statement written by the, um, the co-hosts of Except Palestine, which is City University, UCL, King's, LSE, and hopefully in the future we will have Birmingham and Birkbeck as well. Um, so Except Palestine is a series of town halls taking place at universities across the UK. Its purpose is to emphasize, think through, and reject the exceptionalization of Palestine, to refuse the silencing, intimidation, and Kafkaesque framing of Palestine's ongoing Nakbas. The purpose of Except Palestine is to emphasize the undeniable fact that there is something unique about Palestine, about the way that it is systematically excised from our classrooms, our universities, and our public debate, because it is categorically labeled as criminal and terroristic pol politics and speech. And it is to think with this curious universal excising to unpack, to, uh, to chart how attempts to remove Palestine and Palestinians as a land, a people, a politics, tells us something about our shared condition. This particular censoring of Palestine tells us that there is something paradigmatic about Palestine. The uniqueness of how Palestine is treated tells us that Palestine is a universal. It tells us about all our worlds, there and here and everywhere. So Except Palestine was first held with a panel of eight speakers to a packed room at the London School of Economics. It has since travelled to SOAS, KCA, or King's College and UCL, today at, at City, with further events planned at Birkbeck at Birmingham. Each Except Palestine retains a commitment to refusing the excision of Palestine, yet focuses on a slightly different theme. So last week at the UCL Town Hall, we focused on the politics of Palestinian childhood. We highlighted the impact of the Israeli genocide on children and childhood, but we also looked at the problematic nature of this woman and children framing. So we looked at however well-meaning this women and children framing is, and is itself quite dehumanizing, as it frames men as legitimate targets of violence, but it also ultimately implies that only passive victims are deserving of empathy and support. And today, I, I really hope that we pick up on these themes and we speak about how they relate to the queer community and queer solidarities. So we invite you to take Except Palestine everywhere to other universities and to refuse this exceptionalization of Palestine. And like you said earlier, we need Palestine more than Palestine needs us because the liberation of Palestine there and here is tied to the liberation of all of us. So if later on, if you'd like, you can, there's a QR code you can scan or you can speak to me if you want to take Except Palestine to your universities across the UK. Thank you very much, and I really look forward to the panel. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And great to have you all here. Such a lovely turnout. My name is Kais Campion. I'll be your chair for the evening. I'm a lecturer in race, ethnicity, and social justice in the sociology and criminology department here at City, just over the road. 
I'm really proud to be chairing this important event as part of LGBTQ History Month at City. We have a truly talented expert group of speakers for you tonight from activists, academic and journalist, journalistic backgrounds, each with very thought-provoking talks. As a minimum, these talks speak to the intersections of queer identities. They trouble secularised understandings of queerness and challenge perceptions that homophobia is somehow inherent within racialized minority communities. But beyond that, we hope that they will get you to think critically about the utility of queer politics and organizing in the pursuit of social justice, freedom, and hopeful futures. So tonight, you're going to hear an array, an array of topics, which I hope I kind of summarize correctly, guys. You're going to hear about the centrality of queer solidarities and anti-colonial movements, how homophobia is weaponized against Palestinians and against people of color in the West, and efforts to resist that. Why there are so many queer Jews that are becoming central to anti-Zionist Jewish organizing. How LGBTQ rights in the West can be championed and upheld, whilst at the same time these very so-called Western liberal democracies starve Palestinians of their human rights. We hope that the event is informative, it provides opportunities for us to build new networks, and that importantly also acts as a springboard into further action as we navigate through this moment. Um, and before I go on to introduce each of the speakers, I just want to acknowledge that we're on day 132 of this brutal war on Gaza, and I'm certain that there's many emotions that are likely present in the room. Feelings of disgust, angst, horror, fear, grief, and of course, fatigue at what we are witnessing unfold, still unabated, despite our best efforts. And we're quoting a lot of our favorite black feminists tonight, but um, Audrey Lord, you've already spoke to this already, Gretchen, but without community, there is no liberation. Um, and I hope tonight, to echo what you said, that we can feel that we're in community and that it goes some way in sustaining and maintaining gospel because I think it's really important. Okay, so just a quick one down on the structure. So I'm going to start by introducing our speakers. Each of them will talk for a short time on a chosen topic. This will then be followed by an in kind of conversation piece where I'll pose a few questions to them to talk amongst themselves. If that gets, if we feel like that we kind of squeeze for time though, I'll make sure to cut that so we give you guys time to ask um, questions that you want. So then we'll take a short comfort break, let you guys consider your questions and open up to the audience. I want to please note uh, that one of our panelists, Ilias, is deaf with a cochlear implant. So we encourage that you all speak very clearly into the mic, face on, so we can both hear and see your questions. And if you've got a mask, obviously momentarily move them, please, as he relies on lip reading. So that's it from me. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Dr. Abira Khan. He's a lecturer in gender and sexuality at the Centre for Gender Studies, SOAS, University of London. Her knowledge, production and pedagogy is concerned with the interrelatedness between empire, gender, race and sexuality. Abira's work provides critical interventions in queer of colour critique, particularly regarding the category of queer Muslim. She has published in the Feminist Review, Feminist Formations, Lambda Nordica, and Religion and Gender. Currently, she's developing her book monograph, tentatively entitled Becoming Deviant, Race, Sexuality, and the Queer Muslim. Over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Is this mic working? Should be. Can you hear me in the mic? No. No. Yes? Yes? Yeah, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, in the time that I have, I want to briefly touch upon two points or phenomena that relate to queer feminist solidarity with Palestine. So I'm going to offer you some reflections on how those of us in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle need to critically engage with, how, with the ways that one, homophobia, and two, sexuality and gender, configure in the genocidal violence in Gaza and the rest of historic Palestine. So I want to start with homophobia, that thing that always follows queers in solidarity with Palestine. My work is on queer Muslims and the specter of Muslim homophobia, this imposition of the question of what about Muslim homophobia is persistent in my academic life and to an extent in my personal. 
It's part of a broader dynamic whereby queer Muslims are only of interest to the dominant imaginary insofar as they affirm the notion that Islam and its followers pose a threat to British society. Whether it's the material threat that's posed by their lack of integration or the ideological incompatibility of Islam to the nation's values, right? So it's a very typical clash of civilizations narrative that instrumentalizes queer Muslims and it makes two assumptions. One, that homophobia is the only thing that makes queer Muslims or queer people in general vulnerable. And two, that racialized migrant or other othered communities are what introduce hostility and violence to queer and trans people in this otherwise democratic and allegedly free nation. So this is why, for example, you will almost never see queer Muslims invited to speak as queer Muslims about the structural exclusions faced by Muslims in this country. They're not likely to appear in popular media speaking about the impact of austerity and deepening economic deprivation in Muslim neighborhoods or on the imperial violence in Muslim countries or the dispro disproportionately high rates of incarceration of Muslims in British prisons. This is because the terms, the conditions of possibility of dominant society's recognition and representation for the queer of color subject is to affirm the asymmetries of the dominant order. In, or, in other words, the queer person of color, the queer Muslim, and yes, the queer Palestinian is only of interest to the hegemonic social order insofar as they can be used to perpetuate the social order's racialized and imperial project of subordination and indigenous annihilation. So we see a very similar logic at play in how the idea of homophobia is used in the genocidal campaign in Gaza by Israel. The image of the IOF soldier holding up a pride flag is in its declaration of bringing whatever it thinks it's bringing to Gaza. So that could be queer pride or LGBT rights or whatever it is that it thinks that it's doing. This image is steeped <clears throat> in, the in the depravity of colonization. It's not only a deceitful declaration of the Israeli colonial project as a form of deliverance, it also attempts to convey a dehumanized conception of the people and the land that it is destroying. This, this colonial use of the accusation of queer phobia is by no means the only logic or even the dominant logic that undergirds the occupation. But it does reveal how sexuality is exploited. In the colonial Israeli grammar, the pride flag in the foreground of the image justifies the background of the image. Deliberately flattened landscapes, devoid of the previous color and content of entire worlds held in the ruins and rubble of Palestinians murdered and displaced. It betrays the calculated delusion motivating its own genocidal campaign. So outside the boundaries of historic Palestine, the accusation of Palestinian queer phobia is used to delegitimize queer solidarities with Palestine. Some of you may have seen, for example, this Israeli TV show skit circulating on social media, which mocks Palestinian solidarity campaigns in American universities. The students depicted are coded as queer in their aesthetic and in the way they speak and identify themselves, etc. So the skit ends with a deeply racist depiction of a Hamas fighter threatening these students for being American and queer. And the students are none the wiser. Um, the thesis of this Israeli skit is to ridicule solidarity, to position that as the delusion, a misapprehension of reality. This is just an offhand example of a broader trend of Zionist and right-wing mockery of queer solidarity with Palestine, which insists that the principled anti-colonial stance for the liberation of Palestine and Palestinians is counter the interests of queers themselves. So I don't think personally or politically for that matter that it's worth engaging with the accusation of homophobia. It falls into the trap of making life and livability conditional. But I think it is worth critically engaging with the rationale underlying the accusation. Beneath Zionist's disparagement of queer solidarity with Palestine is the assumption that to be queer is to be only invested in the survival of the self at the expense of others. It is a displacement. It displaces its own zero-sum view of the world onto queer and feminist politics. In doing so, it reveals the moral destitution of the colonial imagination. It's myopic view of not only queerness, but solidarity itself. It is completely ignorant, for example, to the histories of queer and feminist solidarities and collaboration with anti-colonial movements. Not only that, it is also ignorant to the premise of solidarity in the first place, that our livability is interdependent and our interdependence is contingent on the end of colonial violence. 
So the uses of sexuality in any colonial context spill over homosexuality, so to speak. So here I'm thinking of the many images we've seen of IOF soldiers in abandoned and ruined homes across Gaza. The image of the IOF soldier holding up a negligee in the remains of a Gazan family's home demonstrates how the material displacement and annihilation of indigenous populations is not sufficient for the colonizing force. It also relies on the ideological debasement of intimacy and life of the colonized, even sexual life, in all its mundane and human forms. This is also how sexuality appears in the colonial context. It is not limited to the evocation of the queer subject. We need to be attuned to how in the colonizer's eyes, sexuality is not a mode of differentiating vulnerable or worthy populations. It's not interested in the homosexual, let alone the heterosexual Palestinian. Queer and trans Palestinians, Palestinian women, Palestinian children under colonial rule are no more worthy of life than the demonized Palestinian man under the Zionist logic. So here, I'm also thinking of what Rafiv Ziada said at the Accept Palestine talk at SOAS, that Palestinian men are no less worthy than the women and children, and I will not be mourning them any less. Sexuality and even gender are part of the logics that, conf that configure, organize material and ideological annihilation under colonial occupation, but they do not offer any rights or safety from colonial violence. What I mean by this is that, yes, there's difference in the gendered experience of colonization and displacement. But gender gains meaning to the colonial apparatus insofar as it aids its project. So there is gendered signification to an extent, but the abjection under colonial annihilation is, as we have seen for the last four months, totalizing. Neither sexuality nor gender offer protection from occupation, colonization, and genocide. That should be the starting point of our solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. What a way to kick us off, Abir, thank you so much. So we, we're going to keep moving through the panel. Everyone's going to have a short time in a similar way to Abir did. And then we'll bring them all into conversation. So is this on? Yeah. Can everybody hear me OK? Um, OK, so next we have Elias Jashan. He's a Palestinian Lebanese journalist and writer. The editor of the groundbreaking This Arab is Queer, an anthology by LGBTQ plus Arab writers published with Saki Books in 2022, which was a finalist in the 2023 Lambda Literary Awards. He is a former editor of Star Observer, Australia's longest running LGBTQ plus media outlet. And his short memoir, Coming Out Palestinian, was anthologized in Arab Australian Other. He has also written freelance for outlets including The Guardian, Gay Times, and Jordan-based LGBTQ ezine, my.kelly. Dot born, pardon me, born and raised <laughs> in Western Sydney. He now lives in London. Over to you. Hey everyone, um, can you all hear me? Um, so yeah, just before I go on, I just want to give everyone a heads up. I come from Western Sydney, a working class family, so if I swear, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can take me out of the Bogan area, but the Bogans will regularly be with me. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, well, I, I mean, I won't talk for too long, but I guess from my perspective, I just want to set the tone, the, the positionality for coming from my um, personal experiences of the queer Palestinian in the diaspora. So whenever I talk about pink washing, it's, it's what I experienced uh, growing up in Sydney and living in London, and basically moving in queer circles in, in that Western dominated, white dominated, and how that affects me and, um, and you know, obviously sometimes the mental mind fucks that puts me through. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I probably don't have to give you a definition of what pinkwashing is. I'm, I'm assuming we all know what that means and how it's just, it's, it's a PR tactic for the Israeli state to distract from the uh, war crimes and genocide at the moment. Um, and I guess it's, what the most important point I want to say is that it's really harmful for um, Palestinians, full stop. Queer Palestinians and uh, Palestinians in general, but especially queer Palestinians, whether whether we live in Palestine or in the diaspora, like myself. Um, and the, I guess the main reason why it's been questioned is kind of sets that tone. Oh, sorry, it's, it's harmful. It's, it's kind of sets that implicit expect, expectation for us to 
either choose between our identities. That we, it's like we're never really uh, given a chance to be able to embrace both and celebrate being both at the same time. So even though I'm from Sydney, it's a, it's a large Arab Australian population there. And of course, there's, there's a lot of us in the queer community in Sydney. Um, I, my experience there, I was always constantly fetishized or talk, uh, reduced to the, our famous dishes. That it always, always has to be hummus or tabbouleh, I mean, the other stuff. But anyway, um, and and so people wanted to sort of pick, they wanted to pick and choose parts of my identity, but they didn't they didn't want to go further than that. Um, they didn't want to sort of look at me as a human. They didn't want to look at this wider story of why I'm why I why I live in Australia, yeah. why my dad had to go there. They didn't ask questions about how he was a he was displaced in 1948 from Yaffa, and um, why I can't get Lebanese citizenship from my mum's side because of patriarchal laws, but I'm getting off track. Um, so, and I guess, I'm definitely getting off track, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is the whole idea of choosing but one between the other, or, some, or, or worse yet, yeah, we're expected to, care, to sort of like, you know, capitulate and accept Zionism and everything that comes with it. So, you know, uh, apartheid, military occupation, ethnic cleansing, second-class citizenship rights, or genocide, as we are seeing in live, in live real time in uh, Gaza now. So, in other words, we're, if we accept Zionism, apparently we'd be better off as queer Palestinians. And um, not only does this erase our agency as, as Palestinians, whether wherever we are, wherever we live, I think it's just utter bullshit. Um, and, uh, you know, and meanwhile, and whenever someone excuses Israel of pinkwashing or tries to highlight elements of pinkwashing pink washing that Israel does, uh, our identity is suddenly weaponized against us. And that's something I, I've probably experienced more than that quite explicitly. Um, funnily enough, I experienced that more coming from Zionists themselves as opposed to any form of homophobia from Arabs in general. And that's anecdotal. I'm not saying you know, homophobia is suddenly disappeared in the Arab community. It's still a big problem. But just from anecdotally, I always had more trolling, more pushbacks from Zionists uh, because I'm queer and Palestinian. And they don't, they could, it challenges their narrative of how I'm not siding with them. I'm 100% I'm, I'm pro-Palestinian, I'm 100% anti settler colonialism. You know, or we can highlight the issue of Palestine as a colonial issue, as a racist issue, as an um, imperial apartheid issue. Um, so. Yeah, and this, this whole, my identity is weaponized against me in the, in the sense that, it's, that quite often I'm told three common things. One, uh, try being gay in, uh, where? Oh, try being gay in Gaza. I'm getting that a lot lately on social media. Or try having a parade, pride parade in Ramallah. Or three, which is really inaccurate, but then it's just started coming out since in the past two or three years in, in the wake of what Daesh did in North Syria and Iraq, to try if you're gay in Palestine, you get thrown off the rooftop. Um, and that is pretty awful because suddenly this heinous crime that ISIS did in Syria and Iraq is suddenly used against me as a Palestinian. And there's no evidence, there's no, his, there's no record of Hamas ever doing that, there's no record of the PA ever doing that. Um, so it's inaccurate and it's suddenly become an awful stereotype that's suddenly weaponized against me as a queer Palestinian. So it's really, really harmful in that way. I'm, 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 I'm sure I'm not the only queer Palestinian that experiences that. And, and my story is obviously one of many, but everyone has their own different experiences. Um, and this whole idea of, especially the notion of try having a pride parade and Ramallah see how they treat you, this, it's that implicit expectation, sort of like, if the colonized, in other words, the Palestinian, don't meet the expectations of the civilized, in other words, Israel, then what, the, what, what, what are we? And that just reeks of racist supremacy and Western and Eurocentric exceptionalism. Um, and that's something I try to push back against a lot. Um, so yeah, and that, that's just sort of my experience as a queer Palestinian. And I've written a lot of that pig washing. I'm quite vocal about it on social media. And, um, and as I said before, the, the pushback I get 90% of the time is always from Zionists and white Zionists and cis gay white men especially. The, 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 the Tel Aviv Pride, or you know, we ho gay, clap and gay guys, kinds. Um, uh, so it's always a specific brand of gay men that always hate this thing. But anyway, um, so um, and it, also there's all, you, you, hear, you hear stories of uh, the Israeli forces blackmailing queer Palestinians uh, in 
um, instance that you know they, they know their gay and that they give us intel about some members of the community, otherwise we'll out them to the community. Um, it's one thing to blackmail people, but it's, I think it's monstrous to weaponize a free person's identity against their community and put them at risk of being outed or alienated or worse yet, you know, completely, you know, have their lives at risk. Um, so it's, it's obviously being queer Palestinian is super, super complicated. Um, but at the same time, as I've never met any other queer Palestinian who's been pro-Zionist at all. We, we always put our identity first. We always put, we always, we're all aware that queer liberation is, will be non-existent under occupation. Um, Thank you, Ilya. So, queer liberation is non existent in occupation, on the occupation. To write that down. That's, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't have been any better. Um, thank you so much. So, we're moving swiftly on. Everyone's been very succinct with their talks and keeping to time. So, thank you, everybody. Um, so, next up, we have Dr. Howie Richavia Taylor who is a fellow in the International Relations Department at LSC, where they convene a class on genocide and collective violence. Howie's academic research deals with the aftermath of both the Shoah and settler colonialism in contemporary Germany, as well as the question of what a transnational queer anti-fascist fascist movement might look like. Beyond academia, they work with several Jewish groups for a diasporic Jewish future that rejects both secularity and Zionism. Yeah, Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks to the, speak to the speakers, thanks to the organizers for having me um, at this time, and especially when we're 123 days in um, to this horrific genocide, and hopefully I can provide something, some food for thought, despite the horrors of what's going on. Um, so synagogues, in Britain that pertain to accept LGBT folks are now more of the norm than the exception. LGBT people can, for example, marry in some shuls, shuls meaning synagogue, and there are already a number of LGBT rabbis as well as an LGBT Jewish charity. Even the chief rabbi of this country has spoken about protecting LGBT Jews. This is, of course, very fraught, but um, he still says it. Uh, for many queer Jews, though, this is not enough. One month ago, I attended the opening Friday night service, or Kabbalat Shabbat, of what is what I think is the UK's first ever truly queer synagogue. Hundreds of people were in attendance, and there was more going on at this service than simply the embrace of LGBT Jewish identities, a lot more. Never before have I sat in a synagogue and heard so many prayers for the end of Zionist settler colonialism. The, va the vast majority of shuls in Britain, synagogues in Britain, are invested in both Zionism and pinkwashing. That is, they will protect queer Jews if we accept Zionism. So what makes this new synagogue unique is not necessarily its acceptance of LGBT Jewish identities, but its commitment to a queerness that is insistently political and one of the aspects of its queerness, I want to say, is a commitment to anti-Zionism and to Palestinian liberation. And we can only hope that prayers for the end of Zionism will become central to all Jewish liturgy today. Um, so if you look around you at which Jewish people are shouting the loudest in this moment on social media and on the streets, who is risking and sometimes breaking ties with members of their biological families in order to support bi Palestinian liberation, and who is working to build coalitions for Palestinian liberation in our community, no matter how fraught and difficult that is. Look at who those people are, and you will see that those folks are disproportionately queer people, okay? massively so. Um, so basically, all I want to offer today is to ask, um, why is this the case? Um, and I just want to suggest that it has something to do with Zionism's politics of gender and sexuality and how it is imposes a regime when when I wrote this down I wrote it down as gendered shame upon diasporic Jews um, but before I go on with this argument 
I just want to be clear, I will be talking about the ways in which diasporic Jews in Britain are hurt by Zionist ideology, but I want to be clear that this is not equivalent to the effects of Zionism upon Palestinians. Diasporic Jews in Britain are complicit in settler colonialism by virtue of our ability to return to land that was stolen in our name, return in inverted commas, um, whereas Palestinians are victims of Zionist settler colonialism in its genocidal forms. People are dying right now. People are literally losing their kin. Um, but I do think that it's important to think about the impact that Zionist ideology has on diasporic Jewish embodiment, which is why I'm talking about it today. Okay. Uh, so one of the reasons that I think, this is a question that I kind of came to me as I was writing this, and I'm just trying to like pontificate on what the answer is. Um, and one of the reasons that I think we're seeing so many queer Jews organizing in the Jewish bloc, for example, is that many queer diasporic Jews are attuned to the heteronormativity of Zionist thought and the way in which it, it has historically shamed Jewish bodies. So um, for those who don't know, it's mainstream historical knowledge that Zionism replicates European racial thought in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries which includes both European colonial discourse and European anti-Semitic discourse, and its related assumptions about class, race, gender, and sexuality. So as Wala al Qasia has argued in the context of Herzl Zionism, Herzlian Zionism is anti-Semitic at its core. It assumes that anti-Semitism could be extinguished by eradicating those Jewish traits which were said to incite it. And she also writes, it's revealed he reveals Zionism as an agent of Western time, one that is enshrined in and reproductive of the colonial dynamics of 19th century Europe. So to quote Herzl, a Jewish state would be a defense of Europe in Asia, an outpost of civilization against barbarism. How much longer have I got? Okay. So um, like Herzl, almost all Zionist thinkers and I say almost because I know there might be someone who's like, but there's this one person. But almost all Zionist thinkers want to extinguish supposedly Jewish traits, especially in the context of Ashkenazi Eastern Europe, such as bookishness that was said to incite the anti-Semitism that was created against us. So almost all set up a dichotomy between the old and the new Jew, and almost all denigrate the old Jew for its feminized weakness. And when I talk about Zionist thinkers, I'm also talking about non-Jewish Zionists, such as Winston Churchill, for those who've never heard this name before, uh, who in Zionism or Bolshevism essentially argued that the diaspora Jew is a feminine communist who can only be tamed with a state. I'm very happy with feminine communist, not so happy with the state. Uh, Max Nordau's notion of the muscular Jew is perhaps the most well-known invocation of this idea of extinguishing the feminine in the Jew. At the 1898 Zionist Congress, Nordau argued that the new Jew that was to become the Israeli would be the antithesis of the diaspora Jew. This is set up as a gendered opposite between the studious, pious, effeminate Jew and the new muscle Jew, who is much more concerned with the life of the body than with the life of the mind. So to quote him, let us once more become deep chested, sturdy, sharp eyed men. For no other people will gymnastics fulfill a more educational purpose than for us Jews. It shall straighten us in body and in character. Our new muscle Jews need to regain the heroism of our forefathers who in large numbers eagerly entered the sports arena in order to take part in competition and to pit themselves against the highly trained Hellenistic athletes. I don't know what he's on about there, but um, some idea of Jews and Greeks. Um, so after the birth of the Jewish Zionist state, I should say, as Mickey Stelder writes, this idea was replaced by that of the Sabra, Arabic for prickly pear, but appropriated to connote a strong Israeli born pioneer with a soft core. And after the Shoah, implicit and sometimes, as we see today, coming from the Israeli state, explicit, the idea of the weak, feminine, and sub subservient Jew who does not support the Jewish state, who apparently went like a lamb to the slaughter during the Shoah. 
Um, so we're seeing this kind of rhetoric also come from the state of Israel, who now argues that anti-Zionist Jews are no longer Jewish. Uh, they would have gone like lambs to the slaughter, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, so this discourse tells us to aspire to be agile, hardworking, fighting, capable, land settling, and masculine, even if we are having gay sex. Um, so it goes hand in hand with the kind of thing that we see in terms of Israeli obsessions with gay soldiers. Um, Daniel Boyarin goes so far as to argue that diaspora is essentially queer and an end to diaspora is the equivalent of becoming straight. I don't know what I think about that, but I'm just putting it out there. Um, so Zionist ideology, the Jewish resistance to Zionist ideology, which ought to happen despite its effect on Jewish people, it ought to happen regardless, but it happens, queer Jews are attracted to that kind of resistance also because of the effect that it's had on us in our communities, the kinds of shaming involved in not being the Israeli image. Um, that's one of the reasons, and then another reason that I won't go into now that I was thinking of was that um, queers in general have experiences of losing biological kin, um, by which I mean losing their bonds with biological kin, um, we are to a degree used to it. Um, being an anti-Zionist Jew can also mean that you lose some kinship relations. We've done it before, we'll do it again. Uh, the straight folks maybe it's not quite the same. Um, so to conclude, support for Palestinian liber liberation ought not to have anything to do with what Jewish people would get out of it. But we can certainly ask ourselves what would change for the Jewish diaspora if Palestine were to be free, a question that most Jews neglect to ask. And I sincerely believe that Palestinian liberation and the end of Zionism in our synagogues, schools, charities would lead to the further queering of Jewish life and the end of the horrific notion of the muscular Jew. Zionism has told Jews that we must be incomprehensibly violent towards those who are our siblings in order to be legitimate gendered creatures within the modern world, that we must embrace the masculine norms of colonial modernity, and I and many, many others today refuse that. Um, lots of reflections thank you so much um <clears throat> okay so we're moving on to our final speaker Hanin. Hanin mikey is joining us from south africa shouldn't say just checking <laughs> double checking again you're all over the place Hanin. oh yeah Hanin. <laughs> i feel like i'm on the tv um i look this way <laughs> um so Hanin is a Palestinian activist working against Israeli apartheid by engaging queer and feminist politics. Through cultivating queer Palestinian kinship and organizing spaces, Maiki has become a crucial voice against pinkwashing and Israel's co-optation of, quote, LGBTQ rights discourse. Maiki views queer Palestinian liberation as a cause connected to global liberation and she has joined transnational movements to challenge occupation and racism. Henin co-founded and served as executive director of al Kaos for sexual and gender diversity in Palestinian society after it distinguished itself as an anti-apartheid organization, organization sorry, in 2007. So Henin is our final speaker. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Are you hearing me well? That's a yes. Okay. Um, thank you for organizing this event, um, and thank you, Sana, for bringing us to Gaza. And this like moment, I have to share that like um, two things from the for the beginning. I I feel conflicted to talk about queer solidarities now in these days, um, not because like the violence is directly um, directed to me, but I feel there is some kind of a 
burden or a bigger thing, and so I'm, I'm bringing my feelings to this also this space. Um, second, reflecting on the this long um, bio that you just read. That I don't know. Uh, I keep forgetting that written bios get uh, read too loudly. That like pink washing and anti-colonial kind of activism in, in Palestine. That that's what I'm going to bring into this table. It's the creation of a group of activists who work uh, closely for 20 years. I'm privileged to be here and talk about this analysis, but this is a work uh, and a labor of uh, hundreds and tens of like uh, activists around uh, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, uh, and other Arab-speaking countries, and other international um, activists. I wanna. Um, we heard a lot about like pink washing through the the panel, and I wanna just like stop maybe uh, a minute and explain that um, that. Pink washing is is started. It's kind of a term that we adopted 20 years ago to start like trying to talk about the language Israel state is using, um, the language of gay and trans rights to direct international uh, attention away from the, their oppression and settler colonialism of Palestine. And that was happening as part of a bigger rebranding. Israel, Israel is promoting itself in international kind of uh, communities that is modern, democratic, and in a gay kind of a sense, also fun, right? Like a, that everyone should come and visit and participate in celebrating this kind of a amazing uh, country. And, and that promotion of gay-friendly kind of a country and state, that was always intertwined with another kind of myth or a statement that while Israel is like progressive, Palestinians are sexually regressed. Right? And we suffer from kind of a homophobia and transphobia that is rooted in who we are as, as a society. So, so these, these stereotypes or like the pink washing as a, as a concept was not like really far or different from uh, all of the efforts that Israel took to uh, demonize, erase Palestinian narratives and resistance all, all the way for 75 years and more. I'm, I'm mentioning this because in a couple of years ago, when we started to expand our outreach work, especially working with different kind of West Bank uh, places and with specifically with youth, suddenly we started to see how pinkwashing is how propaganda as a, as a term, as a branding, as a marketing kind of strategy cannot really capture that aspect of how pinkwashing plays on locally in Palestine, right? And we started to see and hear from a lot of stories how pinkwashing is actually a colonial violence that for and foremost falls on the back of Palestinian queers who live in Palestine and also in the diaspora. So that kind of insight started to, to take us into sh trying to shift locally and internally first and, and hopefully now more internationally and in these kind of uh, uh, gathering like what makes pink washing as a colonial violence? How, how we move from propaganda to colonial violence, how we understand its impact on Palestinian queers, and how we understand, by the way, colonial violence and pink washing in this moment in Gaza. I'm not gonna discuss that because I'm still struggling with that, but I was hoping that the bit of insight that we had till now could help us figure this out. Uh, moving on on queer solidarity with Palestine and how queer voices are bringing have been uh, brought into the table. Um, so basically, I I think I think we always talk about fragmentation, genocide, occupation, and all of the military kind of a uh, aspect of how Israel and the Zionist killing ma killing machine basically erasing Palestinians. And we hardly talk about how. The erasure and the fragmentation mainly happens in, in the sight of the self itself, when, in our self-perception and in our self-determination uh, and in our collective identification. And, and there is, in my opinion, there is four kind of ways how we see uh, pink washing as a colonial violence. And I want to go through them quickly. I hope I will have the uh, five minutes. If not, we can continue with the Q&A. Internalizing, internalizing homophobia and transphobia through pink washing is colonial violence. 
pinkwashing basically pushes this racist idea that sexual and gender diversity are a natural foreign to Palestinian society. And when this idea is internalized both by queers and by the society, harm happens, right? First, how queer Palestinians feel that all the time they are alienated from their society, right? They, they feel they need to give up on one of their identities, either be queer or Palestinian, or hide this or be this, right? All the time, this internalization of being coach. While the impact of this uh, myth in, on society, right, it's, it's in a way strengthening the myth that associate queer Palestinians with Western kind of uh, collaboration, Zionist, Israel, all of the bad words that any Palestinians could not hear, right? So internalizing homophobia inside and transphobia inside Palestinian society do strengthen these myths and, and, of course, increase in, uh, social violence against queers all the time. The second one is, is like pinkwashing itself is this empowering uh, framework. If you, if you all the time, if gender and sexuality, if, if LGBT rights, if trans, trans freedom, right, are essential part of what it means to be Palestinian, the lack of it, the transphobia of it, the homophobia of it, right? If this is essential, the queer Palestinians at some point will, will, will stop believing that they have some kind of radical agency to change that there is no any kind of progression power that could like change it, right? Like internalizing it in a way forces Palestinian queers to describe and experience their pain and their experience through the lens of victimhood, hopelessness, right? Uh, no future kind of it. And you could imagine also living anti -col under colonial, settler colonial, how this hope at the beginning is just not, it's a rare kind of a thing to, uh, to live to. Third point is pinkwashing actually erases colonial context, right? In the pinkwashing story, there is no uh, apartheid wall, there is no colonizer colonized, there is Israel who's gay friendly, who's like believing that they need to save the queer Palestinians, they are like promoting some kind of a myth that there is pink doors that they are open or accessible only for queers, right? All of this exceptionalism of queer kind of friendship between queer Israelis and queer Palestinians. That fantasy of Israeli humanitarianism falls apart as soon as the colonial situation is taken into account. There is no pink doors in the apartheid wall. So imagine also how pinkwashing is just, uh, I don't know what's the word in English, mushawa, right? Like it's just distorting every reality, right? Because like now the machine, the Zionist machine that produces refugees, millions of refugees, they are producing now refugees every minute, right, promote itself to the same colonizer, the same colonized people that they could save them and give them refugee. So that cynical kind of evilness is the heart of pinkwashing. And one last moment, and I will, uh, I will stop here. Pinkwashing erases progressive forces in Palestine. In, in the narrative of pinkwashing, uh, following or building on the, on the point about hopelessness and powerlessness, right? There is one way to liberate itself as queer Palestinian, to run to your colonizer, right? And there is only personal liberation. There is no collective one. There is no progressive voices in Palestine. There is no queer movement in Palestine. There is no al qaus There is no Aswad. There is no amazing collectives. They're doing a lot of work. It's completely erased. And if we talk about colonial kind of a method of erasure, we see here like an, a complete and immediate erasure of the Palestinian queer community who like now recognize in the international like universities and we talk about uh, uh, how al qaus analysis make it to transnational kind of analysis, but still the pinkwashing locally promote our uh, uh, not existence. And, and if we are existing because sometimes people will challenge them, they will, they will say, yeah, but the queer movement is busy fighting colonialism and occupation, right, and neglecting the queers, creating some kind of another myth, another fragmentation between queer communities in Palestine, promoting some kind of a homophobic uh, myth about us. So Pink Ocean is a um, liberal, uh, and I'm happy Samir brought that term, liberal project, and a homophobic, racist, and outdated 
project and first and foremost have enormous impact on the bodies and the experience and the pain of Palestinian queers and Palestinian society in general. Thank you, Haneen. Thank you so much. Um, so we've come to the end of our um, speaking segment. We were supposed to have an in-conversation piece, and I think I will like, <coughs> kick off with a question I could, as an opener. But I also realise that we're gonna, we, we might go over time, and not everybody, if some people feel they have to leave at eight, I don't want to lose people who might have kind of questions as well. So I'm, I, yeah, so essentially I might cut this bit slightly shorter. Um, yeah. Um, because I'm sure you have so many interesting questions in the room that you want to pose to the panel. Um, but in this first kind of piece, I want you to just ask the panelists a question that you can kind of just, you know, discuss uh, amongst yourselves. Um, it's quite a generic kind of opening question, just thinking about some of the things you guys spoke about and some of the threads that ran across some of the talks. Um, so Western models of queer liberation insist on sexual liberation, coming out, gay marriage, and so on. What freedoms does a queer decolonial politics seek, and why? So that's to the whole panel, I don't know if anybody wants to um, kick us off. And Ian, maybe I just thinking about your talk and how it ended there, and you talked about the erasure of Palestinian queer um, kind of movements within Israeli pinkwashing. Um, I don't know, maybe you could speak directly to the demands of al cows You know, like what is that kind of what what, what is being sought um, within al cows kind of organisation? And yeah, maybe you could speak to that more kind of directly. So to, so to pick um, you out, everyone's been a bit shy. They're just warming up. <laughs> uh, I, the only reason why I'm not shy because I don't see the audience. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm also having a lot of connection problems and uh, hardly hearing you guys. But like, I will, I will maybe jump into that, like uh, the freedom. Uh, what freedom does the queer colonial politics seek and why? Um, and I think I prefer if you flip the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think like one one interesting point that um, in in the Palestinian context, and I think in any settler colonial context and, and any colonial context, right? It's it's like the seeking to free us from all forms of oppression was like. It's 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 basics, right? Like and and Al Kaus when when we began and uh, I apologize if it's not clear, Al Kaus it's an LGBT queer anti-colonial feminist uh, uh, activist group that was created in 2001 um, and work in, in, in Palestine in, in a lot of um, areas and. In Al Qaus vision, we we exist to dismantle capitalist, patriarchal, colonial barriers on our bodies and our land, uh, interlinked. And that was like, um, I think, achieving, you know, achieving f freedoms. It's like I feel it's like a far away, but really achieving some kind of a a, a space to discuss what that mean on us. Right, like, and discovering from a grassroots experience that basically, even if we resist that, and even if we had desire to dedicate all of our resources and all of our dreams to some kind of a LGBT or a queer kind of a liberation and forget our like context, reality does not allow that, right? And and in colonial context, there is no way you can like put a finger on where like uh, patriarchal violence start and colonial violence ends, right? It's all interlinked. And that's like, I think, the idea of 
maybe not freedom, but like living these kind of um, realities and understanding its impact and how it's rooted and how colonialism, it's like a, um, some amazing uh, history teacher told us in one of the, our queer school that colonialism is like a white man, right? Like a, a white cis man, like almost like, almost gender and like sexuality is inherent to the colonial kind of a, a project. So, I, and, and, and maybe these Western, I think, resisting uh, not only colonialism and some kind of uh, homophobia and transphobia in Palestinian society, but also this kind of resisting and rejecting all of this Western concept of sexual liberation, right, gay marriage. And we were put in that situation that we criticizing this as a local group in Palestine because immediately from the beginning, we were measured how much we care about the gays and have services, how much we adhere to Western uh, coming out, homophobia framework and all of that. And we were like criticized from the beginning, right? Like, and resisting on the freedom of like owning or, or, or uh, insisting on fighting in all of these levels was a big thing in, in the queer community in Palestine. Thank you, Helene. Does anybody want to add to that? Or? <clears throat> I mean, I think um, Hanin basically covered it, but I think um, building off uh, what she said about freedoms, I think I think about like Ruth Wilson Gilmore when she says about presence and absence. And so I guess for me, uh, freedom in a decolonial pol queer politics would be the absence of premature death and the presence of life affirming structures. So the absence of all that all that enables premature death around us, right? Um, in terms of political violence, institutional violence, structural violence, and then the presence of uh, institutions that we have otherwise been deprived of, or structures, not institutions, that we've been deprived of that enable that premature death around us, right? When I say premature death, that includes genocide, but that also includes the person who, you know, didn't get the health care that they needed uh, because of austerity, right? And connecting um, those phenomenon to each other. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this would answer the question about uh, a decolonial politics of the future and stuff, but I guess one thing I would like to see um, is th this, uh, I guess, enshrining the fact that solidarity should be unconditional, because right now, um, as someone in the diaspora, I've constantly met with this condition that people only give me sol solidarity if I do this A, B, C, and D, and usually the first thing they say, I have to condemn Hamas and all that. And then, then the whole list of things is, oh, why doesn't Ramallah have pride parade? Uh, ridiculous litmus test, which is basically just a form of Western imperialism imposed on queer Palestinians and queer people of colour. So I guess having that, uh, just having unconditional solidarity, regardless of what the differences are, um, is key. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that's such an important point, thinking about the contemporary moment too. Um, thanks, everybody. <coughs> um, I'm just going to ask one more question, I think, and then move it on to the audience, because, as I said, we've got like half an hour to go. Um, but one of the things that I was actually interested in as, as well, I'm thinking about what you were talking about a little bit, Howie, about the kind of the, the old and the, the new Jew and the kind of Zionist framings. Um, in the context of Israeli occupation and Palestinian struggle and resistance, um, to what extent do you feel, so, so to what extent is the nation state's sovereignty and unity across difference a dominant framework and discourse? And what role do you think sexual politics can play in envisaging the nation? So essentially in, the, both, in kind of both Israeli occupation and Palestinian struggle, it's kind of uh, nationhood identifications across difference, the flattening out of difference, I guess, that can come, become priority and become the kind of dominant discourse. Um, and how do you feel kind of, um, yeah, sexual politics can play a role? Yeah. I'll take a stab at this. Um, and this is just my opinion, the, and, and based on what I know. Um, the nation state has always been 
producing violence against LGBTQ people, no matter how they've labeled themselves, even before LGBTQ as terms have been adopted, the nation state, in, in order to kind of preserve its sovereignty, has always made an instrument or a pawn either out of queer people or out of queer phobia, one, one or the other. And so I think at some point we probably, if we want to think of queer liberation in some, in some optimistic way, I think we have to think of that away from kind of waiting for the sovereign nation state to give us some breadcrumbs of rights and say, you can have this, but you can't have that. And, and to me, that touches earlier um, on, on the point that I brought up earlier about how the nation state is also very unreliable, um, whether it's liberal or not, whether it's left or right. Um, Americans know this, perhaps, and this, again, I come back to the American example once more, um, just by virtue of how old that movement um, was. There were times when, no matter how left or right the government was, LGBTQ people, trans people, anybody who was queer was not accepted, and the state did not advocate for them. And there, there could be, again, a time when the nation state no longer finds homonationalism, um, the salient uh, good strategy for them, and they will drop homonationalism, and they will drop LGBTQ rights in the same exact speed that they adopted them, probably not f even faster. So I think queer liberation, if we want to think of, of, of an optimistic future in that regard, we cannot wait on the nation state to produce that for us. Uh, um, add on to that. I, my, I have a friend, Sarona Abu Akar. She's some of you may know her. She's a Palestinian writer, researcher based in London. She has this piece in Kohol. Um, it's a feminist uh, journal called Suture Fragmentations, and she talks about this. She's Palestinian, and she talks about this idea of queering return. She describes. Um, having lived in exile for most of her life and going back to the West Bank and basically kind of reflecting on the kind of Palestine that she would want to return to, right? And it's not the kind of Palestine where there are corporations and neoliberal institutions running it, right? Which is what is inevitably going to happen if the Palestinian Authority continues in the way that it's doing, right? Um, and so she talks about queering return of like not having the same institutions that enabled the displacement of her family in the first place, just ruling Palestine in a different form, right? And I think that is something that queer politics isn't the only thing that offers us, but like a radical approach to queer politics can offer us that way of thinking, right? Of like, what is the, um, what is the form that sovereignty can take and that doesn't have to be nationhood in the way um, that we know it. Um, and I also think that there is something to also, yeah, be thought about in terms of like the framework that is available in thinking about what Palestinian sovereignty can look like, right? And like the post Oslo landscape is a disaster um, and the Palestinian Authority has been collaborating with Israel and doing security coordination for decades now. And they are not going, and they, the, what is happening in the West Bank at the moment in terms of the resist, in terms of them attempting to speak out against what's happening in Gaza, it's absolutely abhorrent. And so, yeah, I don't think that uh, sovereignty in terms of the nation state is going to save anyone, let alone um, Palestinians. Um, I just making notes, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay. I think we'll open up now um, to the floor. So, yeah, does anybody have any questions for the panel? We have a microphone that we can... To everyone, um, super great to hear from everyone. I, I'm going to try and formulate it as a question. I guess it's more of a reflection. Everyone always says this. It's very annoying, I know. But <laughs> um, it's just what it made me think of, I suppose, and, and would hope that you would reflect with me. I don't know. Um, so I think one of the things that really stuck out to me um, is like just thinking about what both Howie and Samir said and like kind of putting it in conversation um, and specifically about like Samir talking about like Palestine being a template now rather than accept an exception. Um, and then thinking about what Howie was saying about like kind of this idea of like the, the feminized Jewish person who needs to now become kind of remasculinized. 
Um, and a lot of that just reminds me of, um, like, I'm Indian. I work on, like, queer and trans politics in India. And a lot of this just, like, reminds me of the ways in which, like, Hindu nationalism is kind of also, like, positioning itself. I mean, there's a lot of also great literature on, like, the, um, the parallels between Zionism and Hindu nationalism. But I feel like there's also this kind of move in, like, contemporary Hindu nationalism of being, like, the new Hindu man is one who's kind of not feminized as he was by the colonial project. But, you know, this whole idea of, like, Narendra Modi, like the Prime Minister of India, having like a 56-inch chest. This was a big thing. Um, last year, those who, some people might know this, it was like this whole thing about like the size of his chest and you know, he's a big, great, massive man, whatever. Um, but I'm just thinking of that also in terms of like then thinking of like Palestine as a template for Kashmir, you know, and, and the occupation of Kashmir and then also the northeast of India as well. Um, so I'm just thinking a lot about, and, and there's a lot of like Hindu nationalist leaders who've talked about how they have taken inspiration from the Zionist project to make India like a Hindu nation, right? And obviously what's like kind of implicit in that is Hindu nation at the expense of the Muslim population. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I guess these were things I was thinking about. I don't really have a question in there, but I would love to hear more about what the panel's thoughts are on this. Thanks. meant to just break the ice, but um, um, <laughs> I think uh, in, in a way it's a question for all of you, but I will ask it maybe to uh, Hanin and Abira, uh, because of those questions. Uh, part of the kind of the, the violence that, uh, that, that queer people constantly um, experience is disinheritance uh, and constantly having to, 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 to kind of reinvent knowledge, right, to kind of to find out constantly from scratch how to look at their bodies, how to understand the relations uh, in different contexts. Um, the, the, the kind of the, the destruction that we're seeing now of Palestine, is, and, uh, it will result in some kind of uh, re restoration eventually. It will be restoration um, that, that happened before. Destruction happened and then restoration and destruction and restoration. How do we make sure, in terms of thinking, in terms of queer solidarities, how do we make sure that there is some, something of a queer knowledge and a queer inheritance that, that, that survives, that continues? It's kind of constantly being kind of, we're kind of searching through fragments. Mostly there are no fragments to be found of the, from the past destruction. So do we think in terms of um, archives, in terms of knowledge that endures, that is, that, that is somehow stronger? Um, that's a big question, I know, but maybe something here for us. Thank you. Yeah, one more, maybe? You can, we, I think we'll go okay. back to the, if anyone wants to take, we'll, we'll, yeah, who, anyone wants to speak to either of those two questions, that would be great. Yeah, I can say something about the Hindu nationalism point. Um, firstly, uh, there's clearly overlaps. Um, there's clearly also differences. I mean, Jews were not colonized by the British. And um, those like ideas of decolonialism are simply not true. Or at least that discourse in India has some <laughs> truth to it. Um, I didn't know about this idea of the Hindu man being feminized by colonialism. I'd be fascinated to hear, like, read more about that um, and those overlaps. Um, but I think there's also similarities in terms of the ways that Hindu nationalists are weaponizing decoloniality, indigeneity, and as part of the dangers now in terms of decolonial discourse generally, because you see a lot of Hindu nationalists using it. Um, so, and there's lots of people working on that now. And it's, yeah, so, really good point. I'd love to read anything you have about that. Um, and the, the question about queer inheritance and how it will survive and continue is a really bad summary of a really detailed question. Pardon? Oh, yes, yeah, Sanin, that was, that was kind of directed at you, wasn't it? Do you? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And actually, 
I, I, I left my position as the director of Alpaus two, two years ago, three years ago, you know, COVID-19, genocide. The years are really, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And, and I think I was, uh, I removed myself from queer organizing for a couple of years. And it's really weird that in the last year, a project we have been thinking a lot in the last uh, decade that we never got to do is um, to archive all of the Palestinian queer movement, which is, uh, we are recognizing now it's a huge project that needs like years of, uh, of a lot of labor and investment. And, and I don't know why in this moment, which it's one of the most horrifying moments in, in history, or in my history at least, Right, like uh, the archival project of al Kaus started to get some more meaning, uh, feeling some kind of responsibility. I think that's alongside with some Palestinian uh, organizing around the archive uh, in general and the long history of Palestinians who are archiving their Nakba and their suffering and their experience. So I think that is what kind of um, the sentiments you were like, uh, trying to bring in your question that was exactly how we can like keep something, how we can like make this like analysis and like the production of knowledge that we had in the last 20 years survive, grow, how we can go even uh, past the last 20 years. I'm sure the queer uh, community of the last 20 years would, it's, does not describe the queer history in Palestine and that needs a lot of research and amazing like work. So, um, so yeah, like I'm sharing that we are like trying to do that now and like bring uh, activists to this kind of uh, um, effort. Um, and I share a lot about like the sentiment of like how we can really ensure things will survive, stay, evolve, be passed to other generation. And so I share a lot of these like kind of uh, thoughts and feelings. Thank you, Hanin. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? One back. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I've wondered in your panel you discussed very much colonialism and violence in terms of masculinity but i cannot believe that there is not women being violent and so i, w I wanted to invite that reflection because if you see like in the segregation of the american south uh elizabeth gillis palmer gray is fundamental says are the women fighting for segregation so i wonder where the women are while we're looking at militarism uh, in the ostentative mourning or the demands or the do you have some reflections on that or is it too too hidden <laughs> in the news in the videos on youtube i can i can speak to that um this actually connects to what tanvi was saying about the indian state right right-wing fascist states are obsessed with reproduction the ideological reproduction but also biological reproduction right and so both ideological reproduction of the nation on fascist lines on right-wing lines right relies on an entrenchment of traditional forms of gender right and that includes masculinity right like a kind of masculinized whatever macho sense right so like for example the strong hindu man or the you know uh, i don't know butch like whatever right and, but then it also relies on a specific calling for femininity, right? Um, so in some instances, that's a domestic femininity, but in uh, we can see in the Israeli occupying forces, it's a femininity that highlights whiteness, right? The, the white femininity of many Jewish women who serve in the IOF, it highlights like a very specific kind of like desirability politics in its propaganda machine. Like we've been seeing that online. There's a really absurd, um, like, I don't know this, I feel like if I go, get into this, I'm gonna get into like really like niche internet culture about like the way that I, like, is, like IOF female soldiers, uh, present themselves on social media is deeply disturbing, right? In the way that they play with their femininity, in the way that they they like pr 
reproduce the gendered self and the gendered nation. And I think there is, I, I think the comparison that you made with the American South is very apt, right? In terms of the kind of deep complicity uh, of womanhood, which is why I always say that it's gender, not, it's, yeah, it's, we need to look at gender and gender means looking at gendered relations, not just like, woman. <laughs> um, yeah.